hello everyone we are going to go ahead and get started here um, hopefully you can all see us on Hoover. <laughs> Somebody will let me know if you can't. Uh, so I just wanted to welcome everybody to the 31st annual North Carolina Serials Conference. My name is Tessa Minshew and I am a co-chair of this year's planning committee and I have the honor of delivering the opening remarks today but I've only got about five to six minutes to do it and I got a lot of ground to cover so we're just going to jump right in. Um, Due to the pandemic, the conference is virtual, but it's still very important to acknowledge that we work on land that was and still is home to many indigenous peoples. Out of respect for North Carolina's indigenous communities, the NC Serials Planning Committee has made a monetary donation to the American Indian College Fund. We also strongly encourage our attendees to donate their time and money where they can. To aid in this, we've curated a short list of organizations doing important work on behalf of Indigenous peoples. The American Indian College Fund is the United States' largest Native-run charity supporting Native student access to higher education. The Center for Native American Youth is a national education and advocacy organization that's dedicated to improving the health, safety, and overall well-being of Native youth ages 24 and under. The NDN Collective is an indigenous-led organization using activism, philanthropy, grant-making, capacity building, and narrative change to help build the collective power of indigenous peoples, communities, and nations. Please see the Whova organizer announcements for these links. So the conference would not have been possible without a wonderful bunch of people pulling together. And I just want to take a moment to give a big thank you to all of our 2022 planning committee members that you see on the slide here. Big round of virtual applause for everybody. Yay! Hardworking volunteers. We couldn't have done it without them. As is a longstanding tradition, Serials Review is also going to be devoting a special issue to this conference. So please do keep an eye out for that. Now, we are committed to providing our attendees with a fun, inclusive, and welcoming conference experience. To that end, I draw your attention to our code of conduct. We would be stunned if we had to invoke this, y'all. NC Serials attendees are always such lovely folks, but we do take the code very seriously. If any issue arises, please notify a member of the planning committee and we will address it. You can find our emails on the planning committee page of our website. We also want to extend a big thank you to our 2022 sponsors as seen on this slide. I'm not sure if I'm looking in the right direction. But <laughs> the online conference experience really isn't ideal for sponsors, as we all know, and they have stuck by us through a second year of this, and their generosity is the reason that we can keep registration so affordable. So another big round of virtual applause for our sponsors. Also, please attend their lightning sessions from 11.15 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. Eastern Time so you can learn all about their awesome new initiatives and products. Now, we really miss seeing you all in person, but we have to admit the virtual format really helps us welcome attendees from all over the place in a way that we just couldn't before. This year, we have 229 library vendors, employees, and students from across the United States, Canada, and the UK. Thank you all so much for taking the time to be with us today, and we hope that you find your experience valuable. To that end, I want to give you a few quick notes about the Whova platform. It's brand new to us this year, and there's been a little bit of a learning curve, so we really appreciate your patience with any hiccups that you might encounter. We have been told that Google Chrome is the best browser for desktop Whova enjoyment, so if you're in a different browser, you might consider switching over for the day. To make things a little bit easier on our ragtag band of volunteers, we ask that you use Whova chat for your questions and comments. If you're having issues with the Whova platform and you need to view the sessions directly in Zoom, please be aware that Zoom chat is disabled for attendees, but the Zoom Q&A panel will be available for your questions. We also want to remind you that the Whova chat will only be actively moderated during each session, and the Whova discussion boards will not be moderated after the conference has ended. If you have follow up questions for any of our fabulous speakers after they finish speaking, please reach out to them over email. Oh, also, one thing I forgot if you're on VPN and you're having some issues, try getting off your VPN. Sometimes that helps. So, some of our speakers have already uploaded their slides to the Whova platform, and you can get to those via the sessions in the Whova agenda. 
post-conference, we will try to archive the session slides and handouts on the agenda page of our website, the URL for which is right here on this slide. The conference sessions are being recorded and the recordings will be made available to registered attendees in the coming weeks. After three months, the recordings will be made publicly available on our YouTube channel. Got a handy dandy bit.ly link for that right here. And if you'd like to tweet at us or with us, we're at NC underscore serials and the conference hashtag is hashtag NC serials 22. Last but certainly not least, we want to take a moment to recognize our founding sponsor, North Carolina Central University School of Library and Information Sciences. At this time, Dr. John Gant, Dean of the school, will make a few remarks. Hey, good morning, everyone, and thank you very much, uh, Tessa, and to our um, audience and everyone, thank you and welcome to the North Carolina Serials Conference. It's my pleasure to serve as the Dean of the School of Library and Information Sciences. And it's our pleasure to sponsor uh, this conference. Um, but this conference is really done with all of us working together in community to really create an experience for us just to learn and share all what we're learning, especially now during this pandemic, where as you look through our sessions today, uh, you guys are sharing so much information about um, how we're transforming uh, librarian, academic librarianship, and especially around the digital platforms to really make a great experience um, for everyone. And I certainly want to thank our um, uh, organizing committee with all the folks that are part of it, and also the uh, leadership of our uh, co-chairs, including uh, Tessa, of course, uh, Megan Kilb, and Bethany Blankmeyer as well. And then a special thanks to um, our executive assistant from uh, the School of Library and Information Sciences, uh, Anthony Philpott, for all of his help and work uh, on this as well, too. I'm excited about today um, because as we look through here and you look at what's happening, um, this is a conference where we, where you all are helping to co-create along with all of our um, 19 or so different vendors and their companies, co-create new experiences for um, everyone, you know, we're all, you know, in agreement that our part of our what our mission is, is to provide and make ac access to information available for everyone. And to do it in ways so which that folks who are on the front lines at looking at how to um, do bring new research, new light to problems of reducing problems of, of, of poverty and injustice, strengthening democratic values, promoting um, human achievement, promoting scientific achievement and so forth. And we do it all in a way that where you all, that we all value being able to share what we're learning with each other, which you all are doing so generously uh, today uh, as well. So we've got an amazing day in front of us and I just thank you all for coming and participating. And, uh, and I also want to um, thank our um, speaker uh, that's opening today, Katrina Davis Kendrick. And uh, so we look forward to hearing from her. And we look forward um, to participating in all the different sessions today. And I'm amazed that not only do we have 229 uh, people that are involved with the conference today and participating, but we're stretching our reach across the country too with, with speakers that are bringing in and sharing so much good information. So with that, um, again, welcome. And we thank you um, very much for attending and thank you for all the great hard work. And thank you for helping to co-create this experience so that it'll be a great day of learning from each other, hanging out and visiting with all the vendors that are gonna be available with the lightning rounds during lunchtime, seeing their, their latest products and services and so forth, trying to figure out new ways to incorporate that into the experiences that we're trying to create for each and every person that comes and visits um, our libraries as well. And, we, and lastly, I certainly wanna thank all of our students that are here today too, from our different uh, library science programs from around the state. We've got five in our state, and we also uh, welcome all of our students because this is a great chance for you all to learn, see what's happening. And then also the network um, with uh, the, the leaders in our field that are here. And also please just make sure you check out the uh, vendors at, at lunchtime because there's a lot, lot of great career opportunities, both on the academic librarianship side and also with um, the, the companies that provide all the great services and products to our academic libraries as well too. A lot of exciting things happening. So with that, let me turn it back over to Tessa. And again, thank you and welcome. 
Thank you so much, Dean Gant. I think we need to take a moment to congratulate ourselves too, because we are five minutes ahead of schedule. Neither one of us ran over. Yes. <laughs> That's that's a first for me. I tend to speak extemporaneously. So <laughs> thank you very much, Dean Gant. Uh, so we will just start early then. We are all just so excited to welcome our keynote speaker, Katrina Davis Kendrick, who is a researcher, leader, facilitator, coach, and the 2019 Association of College and Research Libraries Academic Research Librarian of the Year. Katrina earned her MSLS from the historic Clark Atlanta University School of Library and Information Studies. Through her practice, research, and advocacy, she's committed to centering well-being, creativity, and empathy in the workplace, and prom promoting career clarity and rejuvenation to workers. So please join me in welcoming her to the 2022 North Carolina Serials Conference. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Tessa. Thank you also, uh, Dean Gant, for your um, wonderful comments this morning. And I do want to acknowledge that because I'm a, um, a member or a graduate of the illustrious historic Clark Atlanta University School of Library and Information Studies, I cannot let you go without mentioning Dr. Ismail Abdullahi, um, who also uh, cultivated many students from your school. And so I recognize and honor that connection that we have today. And he is a wonderful, was just a person, whatever success that I have is due in part to Dr. Abdullahi. So I want to acknowledge that. Thank you so much. Yeah, just real uh -huh. quick, thank you for that. That's really helping to bind our two schools together. You know, we're the last HBCU with library science program, and you guys were second to the last and, and so yes. forth. But Dr. Abdullahi binds our programs together as well. And, uh, and, and we're just honored to have you here today. So thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to go ahead and share my screen, everyone. So I'm going to do that now. Let me know if you can see it, everyone. I want to make sure the tech is good. I want to acknowledge that everyone can see what Let's I see. Look good for my end, Katrina. All right, thank you so much. So what you see in front of you, everyone, again, good morning. I always start off my conversations with my mission because it's important to me and it sets the tone for why I do what I do when wherever I work and whoever I'm working with. So in front of you is my mission is, which is to inspire authentic collegiality and to promote well-being, share the gifts of creativity and cultivate empathetic, engaged leadership in the workplace. Um, another reason I share this with you all is because when I work on my research, with look, which looks at morale in library organizations, library workplaces, one of the things that librarians often talk with me about is their desire to want to do more things or their desire to try to figure out how to streamline their work. And my mission statement helps me do that. So a quick, small um, piece of information and you can choose to try it. If you are having trouble saying no or identifying when to say yes, consider creating a mission statement. If, if it falls outside of my mission statement, um, it really does help me get in tune with this is a definite yes. This is a definite yes, I wish I could and I can't. And also this is a definite no. So I share that with you so you know where I am. And also it's a really wonderful tool to use as you prioritize your um, daily work and also your personal life if it, if it applies as well. So that's my mission, everyone. Today I come to you to talk about my work in my research in uh, library morale in library workplaces. And I've been doing this work since 2016 and we'll talk about culture and countermeasures. What, what happens in culture with morale and how we can bring about some, some measures that can improve morale. Um, so that's what I'm gonna to talk to you today. And today I'm coming to you as a researcher, facilitator, leader, and coach. So today I'm going to share the impetus. Why do I look at library morale? Why am I looking at it? And I'm gonna share with you some of my completed research, some data from my completed research. I'll also uh, explore impacts of outcome on low, low morale, what we call low morale. We'll identify the role of LIS culture and expectations and norms, and I'll reveal established, and I'm still seeking countermeasures. So this work is ongoing. I'm currently in a study right now. I will continue to do this work. Every time I do one study, I have another question that pops up. So I'm looking at things that I've learned in the last few years that seem to be established, and then I'm seeking emerging countermeasures as well. So I'm hoping there are more. And I hope at one point we'll have some policy and understanding of what we can do to prevent or reduce significantly low morale in our workplaces. 
And then I'll highlight ongoing data. As I mentioned, I'll continue to be doing this work. I have several running data collection projects on various aspects of morale in library workplaces. And at the end, I'll answer the questions as they're moderated by our colleagues for NC Serials Conference. So in the chat box, you can go ahead and say if you have your, your if you want to share your name, the city that you're currently in, and recommend an audiobook or podcast that you enjoy. And if you want to get kudos, give the actual episode title or something like that. I ask because I don't know how many of you drive or commute, but I ask because I like listening to audiobooks and podcasts, but also I find myself sometimes in rut. So maybe you help someone find something new. So please go ahead and do that. And I appreciate it. And I'm sure someone might find something interesting. So while you're doing that, I'd like to jump in right in. Why study library morale? Katrina, why are you studying library morale? I didn't mean to. I saw something and I said, huh. So um, when I started thinking about it, I said, well, what does the literature say? about morale in libraries. And there wasn't a lot actually in about it. When I could find things, it was outside of the libraries, usually in business and corporations, they talk about morale as organizations. But historically, morale discussed discrete concerns about compensation, communication, more specifically, poor communication, um, concerns about employee concerns about work-life balance, job role clarity, being unclear in the role, and organizational change. Something's always happening in the organization and you know, there's a new supervisor coming in, shifts and um, reorganizations, but most often about new leaders coming in, high turnover, things like that. When I started looking more, I, once I realized the results of my study, which is a qualitative study, I started going back and I started thinking, you know, really some of these things that are coming up in the study are, are couched and hidden in conversations about job satisfaction in LIS, about employee recruitment and retention in LIS, career choice and motivation in LIS. So if you look historically at those works and then read the studies, you'll see some threads there, but these studies look specifically at morale. So my question in 2016 was, what does it feel like and what does, it, or what does it mean what does it mean to have low morale within the environmental and social context of librarianship? And at that point, I was looking at academic librarianship because that is where I live in academic libraries. I've been an academic librarian since 2000, uh, wow, 2005 or something like that. Right? So I, I was looking at academic librarians. And since then though, I've had all the studies I've done, I've talked to 60 participants and I have over 1,100 pages of transcripts. So while each study has about a cohort of about 20 to 25, it, it generates well more, you know, a lot of data. It's qualitative data. Okay. And I look at librarians now working in North American libraries, academic and public now. And um, my, my methodology is qualitative, not quantitative. So I am gathering data. And the reason that 600 pages of transcripts exist is because I have deep interviews with each person who decides they want to be in the study. And those are 90 minutes, sometimes up to two hour interviews. Um, so there's qualitative methodology called phenomenology, which is to capture, it, it's, a, it's an area of study that captures meaning. So we can understand the meaning of an event in a person's state or an experience or emotional state or something that's happened to them. And what we're trying to do is get down to a description of a universal essence of a, an event or a state of being. So while people's stories sound different when they're talking, what I go back and I say, okay, very method methodically, what can I glean from the common experience? What is the common experiences? And that's how we've come to this understanding of what morale is in library organizations. And I also use what's called grounded theory to better understand continua through the experience. This methodology just helps me understand the continua of minor, like minor emotions. And, and my minor, I mean, not minor as in the experience of it, but those details that are easy to miss if I'm just doing one type of coding. So what I learned is experientially, 
low morale is exposure to repeated and protracted workplace abuse or neglect. And as I've done these studies over the years, there are several types of abuse that repetitively come up to the surface. One is emotional abuse. And the items in black that you see um, are not, they're not limited to what you see. There's other types of, of this type of abuse. So, but the ones that keep coming up um, are manipulation, intimidation, warding, targeting and micromanaging. And I wanna share here that the inverse of targeting is favoritism. So any type of um, unwanted attention, even if, it, if it's deemed as positive by the person perpetrating it, is still a form of emotional abuse because it might be unwanted. Um, the next thing is verbal and written abuse, which includes, but it's not limited to, lying, public shaming, yelling, shouting, ephemeral or unfounded complaining towards you, disinforming, misinforming, snitching, things like that. Verbal and written abuse also includes intentionally not writing something down it, um, to subvert official communications. So um, that includes, that's also there. And then system abuse, which includes system rigging, cronyism, violating policies, procedures, or exploiting them, okay? And the last one is negligence. And this includes um, ambivalent library or campus leadership, a lack of advocacy, capricious decision-making, ineffective communication. Um, people were very, um, the reason I also include negligence here is when people were talking to me, they were very clear on the outright, what, what we would consider the outright abuse. So emotional abuse, verbal written system, those are very clear. But when people were talking to me and I, I this was, this was after I did the data, I realized people are being neglected, but they weren't seeing it that way. They were just seeing, they were just seeing nothing being done as the natural outcome to being abused in the workplace. But really that's negligence. So negligence is nothing being done for you when you share that something is happening, bad is happening to you. So abuse is something bad happening to you. Negligence is nothing being done for you um, when you share that something has occurred that is negatively impacting you. Just really quickly, so my first study was in 2016 um, on academic librarians, and um, that was published in the Journal of Library Administration. And um, I didn't get enough power set, even though I said everybody come, I didn't feel like I had enough representation of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. So my second study was done with um, Ione T. Damasco at the University of Dayton, and we did another study focusing on the low morale experience of Black, Indigenous, and people of color in academic libraries. Um, in 2021, I published up my study on public librarians. Um, and then also in 2021, I published a study on how do people decide to leave low morale experiences and how do those experiences impact them when they move into their new jobs. So that was published um, in um, Alki in 2021. And currently I'm looking at the low morale experiences of formal library leaders. So I'm looking at if you are a formal library leader, if you have a title, um, a, a formal title, you uh, have formal direct or indirect reports. I wanna hear from those people. And I'm currently in what's called Epoche because I, I have another place I, I need to step back. And so I'm in Epoche, making sure I have uh, some space between me and the data. And so I'm on hold with that right for now, but I expect that that data will be ready for publication at the end of this year or next year. These are the things that have been established through all the studies outside of that definition of low morale. So that's been established throughout the, all the studies, those, that, that definition of repeated protracted exposure to workplace abuse or neglect has been validated through all of these studies. So, but the other things that have been validated and established through all the studies are, there's a trajectory of a low morale experience. It keeps being validated over and over again. They, that there are mental and physical health impacts associated with low morale experiences. There are practice and career path impacts that are related to low morale experiences. There is a significant reduced organizational performance impact when people deal with low morale or organizations have low morale. There are impact factors that influence the experience. So it's not just the abuse. There are things that exacerbate and augment these experiences for people dealing with this experience. There are associated frameworks that surround this experience and make these experiences possible. 
So thinking of all that, let's first look at the low morale experience trajectory. Low morale experience trajectory start with a trigger event. There is an immediate emotional and psychological response. You might not know that this is a trigger event until I say later on, when did it start? And what people would share with me was, even though they felt like they don't really know how it happened, when I asked them, when did it start, do you think? It goes back to an experience. And no matter what, they will say, it started this, this person did this. And then they might say, but then this, this happened, this happened. When people go through a trigger event, it's an immediate emotional and physiological response. You can go ahead and think, write down, what do you think the immediate emotional and physiological responses are? Um, I'll give you a few moments to think about that. Go ahead and write in the chat box. There's a trigger event. Something does some, someone does something or says something unexpected that changes the nature of your relationship with that person. It turns that neutral or positive relationship into a negative or uncertain relationship. And that, that spirit of that relationship continues remaining uncertain and negative. People will go back to that. Um, as you are likely typing in the box over your responses, some immediate emotional responses include shock, confusion, anger, and then people go into worry particularly if it's someone a power dynamic, a particular power dynamic. So say someone says something to you and they have a power dynamic that you are in the inferior or the lower or whatever position, you might start thinking things like, am I gonna lose my job? Am I in trouble? Um, are they gonna do it again? So there's the fear. So this can go from, it goes from shock and confusion to uh, uh, fear and worry. Immediate physiological responses include the fight or flight response. And here I wanna be certain that people, everybody, you need to remember that the fight or flight response also includes the freeze response or the fawn response. So if you found yourself in this situation thought, why didn't I do anything? That's your body naturally taking over because you, your body feels like you're in danger. Our bodies um, know before we do. So those are some, what happens at the trigger event. Then we go into the long-term exposure. So this is where the difference between a bad day and a low morale experience is, is the mark. If it was a, da a bad day at work and you had an argument or a slight disagreement with a colleague, within a very short amount of time, that your, your, your relationship will go back to its neutral state or positive state. Someone will apologize. Someone will revisit and clear the air, okay? And y'all go back. In long-term low morale, and with the long-term or with a low morale experience, people began realizing, oh, now this is happening. Now this other thing is happening. This other type of abusive is happening. Now this person is coming over here doing this. Oh, now this new person is coming over here doing that. So there might be different abusers. There may be a different abuse types, but it's protracted. Um, then there, from there, you have your intensified and extended emotional and physical responses. The marker of a low morale experience is the cognitive responses. That's when people start changing their behavior. Behavior starts changing thinking starts changing. And so that's, again, that difference of, oh, I just had a bad day and also, but, oh my goodness, I have to do something totally different. Oh, I'm doing something, I'm responding on a longer term basis differently than I would have if this not been going on. Some of those cognitive responses include changes in daily practices and a change in the perspective on career outlook. So people might start not fully answering questions or lowering their productivity or disengaging from um, other users or withdrawing from their colleagues, right? They might start thinking things like, maybe librarianship isn't for me. Um, I thought it was gonna be this way, it's not. Maybe I should look for another job, so on and so forth. I'm not sure if I wanna be a librarian. From there, people start then doing coping strategies. So that's another link to the cognitive responses because now again this is a behavior so there are coping strategies and there are two ways people respond one is coping strategies coping strategies are things that you do that are positive or negative conscious or unconscious to respond to the neglect so for instance doing yoga you said i don't want to take a yoga class well if you do yoga and you go back to work where the abuser is that doesn't stop the abuser from bothering you even though you really do a real mean warrior one the abuser can still come in and bother you, right? Or do what they're doing. The other way people respond is mitigation methods. Mitigation methods are conscious, deliberate behaviors that people do to end the experience and they impact the abuser, abusers or the organization. Um, go ahead and write down in the chat what the number one mitigation method is. 
And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so people start attempting to resolve the experience. They start trying to either, you know, cut tell human resources, or they start writing down and documenting the abuse, or they might decide, I'm going to create a new policy for this behavior and see if we can mitigate it. Or going back to that mitigation method, the number one way people decide to end an experience is to look for another job. And this is why I say, when we look at the historic literature, looking at recruitment and retention may surface. What, what might have been low morale. People just didn't have the terminology or want to talk about it in that way. People realize that there are um, long-term impacts on their career and health. Um, for instance, if you are um, working at a place where someone is emotionally abusing you, if you leave that position, you don't automatically have, you know, increased confidence again. So people have started telling me, will tell me about weight loss, weight gain, not sleeping well, eating too much, eating too little, um, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, just having gastro, inter, in, uh, gastro problems because their stomach is in knots all the time, anxiety. So these are the things that come up over and over again, general and uh, lots of different ways anxiety presents. So it could be everything from panic, from panic attacks, um, generalized anxiety disorder, ruminating, things like that. When I say there's a recovery period, I put the question mark there because recovery is highly individualized and how long does it take to recover from any sort of trauma? Do you ever fully recover? It's a constant work and it depends on the kind of trauma that you experience, the kind of abuse you experience, so on and so forth. So recovery is, not necessarily guaranteed in terms of, I know that I'll recover in this amount of time. Uh, it'll take a little while, depending on the type of things that you've been exposed to before you feel like you're back on your feet. And like I said, if you develop hypertension at one job due to the stress of low morale, when you go to a new job, you don't stop just taking your, your medicine just because you're at a new job. Hypertension, you have to, that, that, that's something that goes away after a certain amount of time, after a certain regimen, you have to work at that. People do also recognize that they learn lessons and the biggest lesson people say they learn is how not to be that person. Um, if somebody's moving into a formal leadership position, they generally have a very a much lower tolerance and they're much more likely to, to know when low morale and abuse and neglect is happening. And they're much more likely to stop it in its tracks if they see a call out behavior. So, which is a wonderful way to reduce low morale is to acknowledge that a behavior is happening and make sure you can stop it. Um, mental and physical health impacts, I've shared some of them before, um, before, but they include, these are things, again, that keep coming up every time I talk to any cohort, any cohort, um, anxiety, depression, up to post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and another reason I studied this is because people, at least one person in every cohort tells me that they had, they had such a horrible experience that they were considering unaliving themselves. So whenever someone tells me that, I often wonder how many people didn't tell me that. So this is, this is a real, fun, it has a deep impact on people and it has the significance to significantly damage people's quality of life and how they perceive their, their actual lives. Um, people have sleeping disorders, eating disorders, weight loss, weight gain, cardiovascular diagnoses. And these are dangerous because cardiovascular diseases are subtle and over time and you know it's particularly hypertension basically is a it was what we call a slow it's a slow developing um and slow to stop so cardiovascular uh, diagnoses are particularly concerning gastrointestinal distress um so then we look at career and practice impacts and they include increased procrastination increased tardiness increased absenteeism. This goes to that feeling of apathy, okay? People automatically withdraw, okay? Withdraw from the work. One person shared with me that they do what they call planned procrastination. So they knew they would hold the work purposefully. <laughs> they would hold the work purpose, purposefully and do it at the last minute. They would just like, just put it off. So for them, it was a conscious procrastination. And the other thing we know about procrastination now, procrastination isn't necessarily about time management. It's about how we feel about the work that we're avoiding the feelings that are associated with the task. So when we think about the low morale experience, which is full of affective response and physiological response, we can see how procrastination here is, a, is an impact for career. 
and practice. People have decreased concentration in decision-making. If you're under um, stress or under duress, how can you concentrate? Also, depending on the type of, um, particularly with emotional abuse, you're gonna start questioning your decisions. You're gonna just start questioning, what is the other person going to do if I? So there we go into decreased professional confidence and decreased professional engagement. So professional engagement in this context means people don't want to um, join ALA or they don't see why they should go join um, or go to an, an event, right? To go to join and be in the community with other librarians, okay? There's also decreased professional confidence, increased skepticism. So there's a, a issue of trust and not believing anyone, not being able to ascertain or want to ascertain if someone is being truthful and open and transparent. And there's also library workers who go through low morale do experience emotional conflict, what is also known as ambivalence. Um, they're, they're concerned, well, I want to be here. I, li I like library work, but I'm, I, I'm, I, if, I, if I leave, I'm not a good librarian. I'm not a good library worker because people, I need to help people. I want to help them. So there's emotional conflict when they think about leaving. And this is one of the reasons why um, it's hard for, it seems particularly hard for library workers who are dealing with low morale to leave because they have an emotional connection to the work and they feel badly if they choose to leave the users. Um, they feel like they're abandoning the users or abandoning their coworkers who are left to deal with this culture by themselves. People often say that they feel stuck. They begin feeling stuck in their careers. Like if I stay here too long, I'm going to be stuck and I'm worried that I'm not going to get the skills I need to leave. But also, I don't know if I have the skills enough to leave because this is what's happening. So I must not be good enough, right? So there's this very real emotional thread that moves through this process when it comes to, well, why people, why don't people leave? Why do people find it hard to leave? They do want to though, they do want to leave. They do have a desire to leave the field. And of course we know why that's concerning. We all know what the statistics are for retention and recruitment. And particularly when we think about black indigenous people of color. I um, mean, it just is in, in general, when our like, people leave the libraries, how does that, what does that mean for the operation of the library with the person's at home? Um, reduced organizational performance is also a concern or outcome of low morale. These keep, this keeps coming up. So when we talk about reduced, when we talk about in that previous slide about increased absenteeism, increased hardiness, then that means then for the organization, there's decreased employee engagement, right? There's also decreased collaboration if people aren't coming to work in whatever modality that work is happening. Um, there's increased skepticism, again, not only at that other level, but in the, in the emotional level, but within the organization. No one believes anyone does, you know, no one believes anyone. There's a feeling that no one believes anyone. Um, there's increased insularity. And by that, that's when we start seeing silos and factions pull off, right? People have been, and particularly if people have been there already a long time, when the um, abuse happens, people may gel into even more cohesion or even just go directly into themselves by themselves. There are increased workplace neg negative workplace behaviors. Generally, when I talk to people, part of the pieces of abuse were things like bullying, incivility, toxicity, and mobbing. So um, when we think about behaviors that manifest the types of abuse I mentioned. These are some of those behaviors that would manifest that type of abuse. Um, incivility, toxicity, bullying, and mobbing. And another one that came up is one called relational aggression. Colloquially on the street, we call that mean girl. So if you've heard of mean girl's behavior, its formal term is relational aggression. And so many people would talk about how they work with people who act like they were quote unquote in junior high or the cool girls um, the click, they would use the word click a lot. So relational aggression is another workplace behavior that manifests through organizations that have low morale. Um, and there are some differences here too. So these things are part of a continuum. Incivility is low level deviant behavior. 
toxicity is behavior that are negative behavior that is tolerated by an organization. So think of it like introducing poison and knowing that you have poison and letting it just roll through your organization. So that's literally what toxicity is. They also call it poison organizations. Bullying is a person sabotaging one person or a group of people. And then mobbing is a group of people sabotaging over and over again, a person or another group of people systematically for at least six months. There are also impact factors, everyone. So you remember I shared there, these are the things that are happening on the ground. These are individual behaviors that are happening and then how people are responding to the individual behaviors. But when we zoom out, these studies also showed me that there are things that weave their way through a low morale experience, okay? So these are impact factors. And they, and they so they're weaving their way through the um, low morale experience from the beginning through its resolution, the resolution being um, people either leave, people leave some sort of way or extricate themselves from the uh, low morale experience. And these impact factors include enabling systems. If you are familiar with drug overuse um, communities, you probably are familiar with the word enabling. And I use that word similarly here. These are systems that are in place that are supposed to help perhaps stop abuse or neglect or mistreatment at work, but actually allow it to proliferate. So these are individual behaviors, organizational cultures, structures, policies, ethoses that inadvertently enforce or underpin low morale experiences, right? So the impact factors for everyone who I talk to include insidiousness and contagion. Insidiousness is realizing slowly, all of a sudden, like you're a frog in boiling water. You slowly realize, but it's too late, that this is, that this is happening. And there are reasons why that may occur, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. The other impact factor that comes up for everyone I generally talk to in all of these studies is something called contagion. And that is when you realize that other people are being abused or neglected in the workplace, or you're witnessing it yourself, and or you start abusing or neglecting others for numerous reasons, either to deflect your own abuse, uh, people, and also hurt people, hurt people. So that's the, um, one of the impact factors. For well, Black Indigenous of people of color, they experience insidiousness, contagion, deauthentication, and stereotype threat. Deauthentication basically says, I'm not going to share, I'm going to withhold a, a major parts of my personality because I know if I share my personality at work as a Black Indigenous person of color, I may be retaliated against as to explain myself, and I'm already being abused and neglected. Now I have to do this extra work to see who I am. So I'm just not gonna not come in. I'm not I'm gonna keep myself to myself. And the other one is stereotype threat, which is I'm gonna prove myself because I know that I'm coming in here and people have stereotypes about my identity. I have to work extra hard to, to distance myself from those negative things. So I'm gonna work hard to do that. So for instance, as an African-American working in the South or in the United States, one of the monolithic perspectives of African-Americans is that we are lazy. So if I'm coming to a, a, a workplace, I'm going to work extra hard so I can share with, show y'all all that I'm not like that. I'm not lazy. So there are other types of ways that stereotype manifests, but that's one way it can manifest for a person of color, particularly of black. Um, for public librarians, their impact factors are personal safety, resilience narratives, and social context. So that resilience narratives is basically being held accountable for gaps in systems. Like they're being blamed because there's not enough so-and-so, okay? And being called to task, you're not good enough because you're not providing since you don't want to do it, even though we're not providing it. If you're not providing it, then something must be wrong with you. That's basically the cut and dry of the resilience narrative. And then social context, being exposed to um, houselessness, drug overuse, alcohol overuse, violence, um, and not being able to help. They don't have, we don't have the skill sets and we're, or we don't have the, the referrals to help people with those types of larger problems. So those are impact factors that weave their way through these experiences, um, depending on where you are, what kind of workplace you, library workplace you are, find yourself, your identities, you can see that there are lots of ways that these can manifest all during a time when you're being abused or neglected at work. I, I, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but I want to quickly share with you that these are enabling systems. Um, you know, on the uh, left hand, you see the academic librarians uh, enabling systems. And then on the other two, you see the additional one. So that additional means that Black Indigenous people of color 
deal with all of the academic librarian enabling systems, plus all the ones in there in their queue. Okay. Public librarians deal with all of the enabling systems and academic libraries deal with, with the exception of promotion and tenure. Okay. Um, plus all the things you see in their queue. All right. So you can imagine that's a lot of enabling systems to deal with. And remember, all of these enabling systems are things that should help someone extricate or reduce workplace abuse or neglect, but they actually expand it. Right. So if you have any questions about any of these at the end, let me know if you want me to explain them. But there are a lot of them. And so I'm just offering this to you so you can see them. All right. So, so imagine that a BIPOC librarian has up to about 14 um, enabling systems that impact and influence what's going on in their workplace um, when they're, if they're dealing with low morale. There are some frameworks too that I'd like to share with you. Frameworks are things that surround why this might be happening, that help these things along, help them even manifest in library work and library workplaces. Perhaps you've heard of the term or the concept of vocational awe from Fobazi et al. Fobazi talks about how uh, because we feel like our work is a calling, we tend to over identify with that, with our work as a vocation. But also, we tend to weaponize because we see it as overly noble. That means that we can't critique it because it's such a noble profession. So we can't critique librarianship. And so we end up weaponizing our values against other librarians. And so our, our profession cannot improve because if anybody speaks up about something that's wrong in the profession, instead of us trying to fix it, we just tell, say everybody, that person's not a good librarian. If you really care, you would just go ahead and do all the things so we can help the users, right? Uh, help the users, we should just be about helping the users. It's a noble profession. We're here to, we have to uphold democracy. That's a pretty big order considering all the other ramifications of librarianship that are problematic. Um, resilience narratives I shared with you a few moments ago, that idea that um, if you've been told to do more with less, raise your hand, or if you've been told to do more with less, Raise your hand if you've been made to feel like you should be in competition with another library that may have different resources than you. Um, raise your hand if you shared that you weren't able to do something and the response is, well, the other department is. Um, raise your hand if you felt like you couldn't say something that was happening to you because you wouldn't feel like that you had enough strength. That means you're not strong enough like everybody else. If you, no one else is complaining, why are you? Those are resilience narratives and they make us feel like we're by ourselves, that we're the problem, when in fact, it's a system problem, okay? These are system problems. Um, burnout and compassion fatigue, while they're, they, they're, they're often related, they are not the same. Um, compassion fatigue is different, even though it feels the same, it might feel the same in your body. Burnout is a state of physical or emotional exhaustion from being involved with um, public over a long amount of time. Compassion fatigue is similar to that. However, you're so concerned about specific individuals or specific situations that it actually, um, why they call it the compassion fatigue is it wears out your empathy for the situation because you're ruminating on it, you're worried about it. It's another way, another term for um, compassion fatigue is secondary trauma, secondary trauma. So you feel like you're in that situation with that person and you're trying to help them, but you're in the situation with them. Right. Another thing, the, um, another framework that contextualizes low morale is job precarity. So when we look at the numbers, we're not realizing or noticing and hearing more about people trying to find full time, stable work that is associated with the benefits that come with that work. And as I've been doing recent data collection, that number is going up. So the last time I checked, it was like at 40. All the other numbers generally will stay steady, but the job precarity number is rising. A little bit so I'll be watching that and the last framework is something I've come to that it's um recently that as I've been looking closely at low morale during the pandemic is the framework of what's called ambiguous loss ambiguous loss is loss that is unresolved and it's often 
disenfranchised, meaning people don't validate the losses that librarians have experienced during this pandemic, the loss of the physical library space, the loss of seeing people in front of them, um, the loss of not seeing their colleagues, the understanding that we often think of a library as a physical place. And so if I'm not working in a library, am I a librarian? So it's a loss of um, that's unresolved. And even now when we come back to the libraries and find out we are back in the libraries, but we realize that a pandemic's going on, people are still feeling well. Now my mind isn't at work because I'm worried about my family who might be being impacted or I'm worrying about the changing nature of the external culture with this with, and what that means for libraries. People have been gone for so long, I'm back in the library, but I feel like people aren't here like they used to be or when they come in, it's not as uh, open or transparent or it feels like I'm on edge. I don't know what they want to talk to me about or say to me. There are also LIS behavior norms about that impact workplace culture that create opportunity for low morale to exist. The first one is what I call library nice. So if you've ever heard of Minnesota nice, library nice works in the same way in that we perform nice to each other, even if we're really mean to each other. And this is why that insidiousness occurs, right? Because there are stereotypes about librarians and there's stereotypes we even hold it among each, ourselves about how librarians are and, who, and how they act. And one of the things is librarians are nice. Also librarians are meek, we don't fight right? Nothing's wrong with library. Libraries themselves are places of calm and refuge. That's where people come to enjoy life and relax, right? We know that libraries are places full of activity, and because people work there, then there must be problems, but this is what we think, and this is what we may bring into our organization, bring in when we're thinking about libraries. Um, another behavior norm is something called fit. We hire for fit. We want to make sure people fit our culture, and generally what that means is Fit often means we want somebody who looks like us, talks like us, acts like us. So it doesn't really matter if they can do the job. Often when I get to the nitty gritty of when I say somebody's a good librarian or they're a great librarian, rarely does a librarian tell me back in response, oh, this person does a mean record. They can, they can catalog down to the nth. They know all the 500 levels or whatever, right? What they usually mean is they'll say something like, well, she likes to knit and I like to knit too. We have something in common. I like that person personally. So be careful when we talk about fit. Fit and competence um, are not the same. And often we privilege fit over competence. And so that's a behavior norm that comes up constantly when I talk to people about low morale. The other thing is relational regression. Um, again, I shared that that mean girls behavior that comes up over and over again, even in the formal library leaders. So even leaders at, 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 the, at, at, at libraries will talk about being exposed to quote unquote middle school behavior, click behavior. And then also another one is thinking that friendliness means competence. Friendliness means competence. If you're friendly, that means you're good. Um, and so if you're friendly, you might not, you might actually be not great at what you do, but we'll cover that because we're nice and we don't want to offend. And again, that goes back to the vocational awe. We can't critique a librarian. Um, because then we're not a good librarian, right? We're not a good librarian if you are, that's considered non-collegial behavior. No matter how you critique a librarian, we can't critique other librarians. We always have to say only good things because we're noble and we don't wanna crack the surface and let everybody know that maybe we need to fix some things. You might be thinking, well, how do I know I'm in a low morale workplace? These are some things you can be thinking about. If you have are at a workplace that features silos and people being isolated, whether they are isolating themselves or being isolated by people who are perpetrating that upon them, you might be at a low morale workplace. If you are at a organization that is insular, and this includes people who have been there for a long time, I should say that it's great if someone's been there for a long time that helps our organizations with organizational knowledge. Where the shadow side of this is, if people have been there a long time and they have, might have been abused or anything like that, what happens to that organization? They're leading from a, a place of perhaps apathy, right? Considering. But also, insularity can happen at the organizational level. Nepotism, cronyism, okay? And when I say nepotism, particularly for those of us who are in academic library uh, organizations, 
I call formally there's formal nepotism, which we know how that works. That usually means an organization doesn't hire family members in the same vision. But we also know in, in, in academia, people are hired in other division in other divisions who are still in the same organization. So that's a form of nepotism. It has the same impact, even though it might not be te technically it might not be, it has the same impact when when um People who are hired, you know, whole families being hired, even if they're in different pieces of the organization, it has the same feeling, it's the same outcome. Um, the other thing is, if your organization privileges competition over development, you may be in a low morale workplace. So, and I, one of the things I always wondered about as an academic librarian is, why are people trying to set me up in competition with other librarians when, in fact, I only had to compete for myself? and show my best case to the promotion and tenure committee. My, my case is my case, but I, we will often be sort of pitted against each other. And I had to stop that kind of thinking very early on in my career. I realized very early that this was a false competition cycle. Like I have to present my own case to the promotion and tenure committee. Why am I being compared? Why am I comparing myself? Or why are people trying to compare me to my colleagues? That's not gonna happen. You might hear this when people start talking things about rock star librarians or, giving people undue attention. Are people, you should acknowledge people's accomplishments, yes, um, but trying to create false senses of competition over developing and improving people, if that's not happening, if you're not being developed, if you aren't being developed, if they're being challenged to compete against each other falsely, you may be at a low morale workplace. If your organization is a gossiping um, mechanism or has significant rumor mills, you may be at a low morale workplace. Okay. Um, I do realize that there's a, another side to gossiping, and that is a survival communication channel. I recognize that those are valid communication channels. And also, though, if there's a gossiping, just constant gossiping, and no one ever gets a realization of what the real story is, it's constantly gossip, 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 you might be at a low morale workplace. If your organization or people in your organization do everything to they avoid, they can to avoid conflict, or if they do what I call broad stroke problem solving or broad stroke discipline. So if one person messes up and nobody can do the thing. That's a methodology for a conflict avoidance because what they're essentially doing is not going to that person and talking to them and having them be accountable for their behavior. So accountability is a large piece of this. If your organization shuts down or condescends to any kind of modicum of employee autonomy, you may be at a low morale workplace. So I've shared with you um, this sort of, this is what, what I've been doing, why I'm doing it. These are, this is what I call it. This is what it is. This is how it, what it, what, how it goes. This is what the impacts are. Let's talk really quickly about some countermeasures. My broad level umbrella term for my countermeasures, I call them self-preservation. Self-preservation is a countermeasure for low morale. Because what happens is that fight, freeze, or flight response is like this. And people often do this because they're not expecting it. And then they realize they think it's going to go away because librarians are nice. And then they slowly realize that these things keep happening. So self-preservation tools are the a set of a skills that you have at the moment that you feel like abuse or neglect is happening right then you use them. So it's akin to having a life jacket. You hope you never need it, but you know where it is and you know where to go get it should the, should the boat start to take on water, okay? So self-preservation tools. They include broadly assertive communication. Often we don't know what to say. Librarians often are worried because we are, want to help people because that is very, very broad too, which is problematic. We often find ourselves being worried about what other people might say if we have to tell them something, particularly if it's something unpleasant. Assertive communication, if you haven't taken a training on assertive communication, I encourage you to do so and practice it. It is a practice, but assertive communication means that when someone says something to you, you have a set of, you have that assertive communication skill set where you can maintain your dignity and maintain their dignity and everybody is clear, even if it's something that is unpleasant. And even if you have to agree to disagree, you're clear and you made your case known at the beginning, right when someone says something to you, you can, you can address it right then without fear or with reduced fear 
or like I say, be afraid and do it anyway. You need to be able to speak up when someone might be verbally abusing you or emotionally abusing you. The other one is informal leadership. We often feel like if I don't have a title, that means I can't do anything. But really, you can do more as an informal leader in many cases than you can do as a formal leader. Informal leadership is a self-preservation to lead yourself. We often say, well, wait, maybe someone else will do something. Maybe, maybe blah, blah, blah will write a policy. Or maybe if the human resources would only do A, B, and C. Um, but why are we waiting on someone else? Um, we don't have to wait for someone else to improve our lives, even our work lives. Boundaries. Boundaries are connected to assertive communication, but they're also very, they, they go beyond assertive communication. It could be a time boundary. It could be um, a work boundary. It could be a project boundary. It could be an action boundary. I'm not going to do. You can't do this to me. Um, and those are um, significant. But and I, I will say this. Everybody already knows what their boundaries are. The concern here is that we often give our boundaries away because other things take hold. And that goes back to knowing your boundaries, understanding you can have self-compassion about keeping them. You might have to adjust them, but do know what your boundaries are and honor them. Honor your boundaries, whatever they may be. Another self-preservation tool is creativity. I think it's part of my mission, but also it help us, helps us be um, nimble. So, and I also found that when people would talk about their impacts, they would share with me that the first things they let go during a low morale experience is all the things they enjoy. They stop their projects, they stop their hobbies, um, they stop playing whatever their forms of play are, but really the creativity will help your mind and help you regain a sense of control and also help you gain and keep your sense of your identity outside of work. I'm Katrina and I still like K-pop and I'm gonna go watch this. I'm Katrina, I like riding bikes, I'm gonna ride the bike. It has nothing to do with work. That's who I am, whether I'm a librarian or not. These are the things I like. And so it connects you to your identity as a person rather than as a librarian, which could stop with, reduce the vocational awe of, I'm a librarian, you know, I'm thinking about work all the time, what's happening at work, if only so-and-so at work would, A, B, and C. What about the person that's not, that doesn't go to work? The other countermeasures include inclusion and community. Please, 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 if you're going through low morale or have gone through low morale, this is the time to engage fully in as much continuing education and professional development as possible. People tend to withdraw, but a proven countermeasure is when you feel a need to withdraw, that is when you seek out. So join committees on, if, if low morale is happening in your organization, find a committee on another part of campus. If you are in a public library, go to another library and say, hi, how y'all doing? What y'all doing over here? Join your county library association, join your union, join those organizations where you get validation and you know, and that way you will know and will also cut off that conversation of, am I good enough? Do I have the skill set to leave? Um, am I really good? Is, am I as good as that person? That person says I'm a bad librarian, but over here on this committee, I'm doing great work and we have an outcome over here. So that's just over here. It would really help with those counter narratives bring you counter narratives that validate it. Also collective care, this will stop insidiousness and contagion, caring about others in, the, you know, in your library. Usually people stop talking to each other. They forget that people have other lives outside of the library. Collective care, mutual aid, good morning. How are you? How was your weekend? Um, I remember you said last week, blah, blah, blah. How did that go? Um, do you need anything from me? What can I do for you? Rather than coming together to just commiserate, what can I do for you? I can do this for you. What, what, you know, what can in that person can say that I can do this for you, right? Begin thinking about how you can be a collective care agent, a mutual care agent in your organization. And always think of everything through empathy. Everyone has a story to tell. And empathy, having empathy, even for an abuser, is not a, a betrayal of your cause. You can have empathy and realize that if something has happened to you, then if something has happened to them, they might be bringing that to you. It doesn't excuse their behavior, but it sure humanizes them. And that gives you some leeway for your own ego to take a back seat so you can relax and do what you need to do and maintain um, purview over your own self. And that goes back again to informal leadership. Courage is also um, required. Thank you. Um, here. So be courageous as much as you can. Also understanding that courageous means sometimes you have to step back. And that's where self-compassion comes in. 
I note on leaving low morale, if things are not improving, leave. Leave, if you can possibly, leave as soon as you can. It's not your job to fix it. It's not your job to see if, if that person will get better or stop abusing you. Um, if you can, leave. Leave if you can. If you can't leave, invoke self-preservation without apology, okay? During interviews, do not ignore or discount red flags. Keep in mind that no, but also keep in mind that no workplace is going to be perfect. But if somebody gives you a red flag or you feel that it's not right, do not jump from firing pans into, fry, into fires. When you go to your new organization, reset your trust and focus on your boundaries and health. Give the people at your new organization an opportunity. Just trust them until they show you that they're not trustworthy. Don't walk in skeptic because you'll never really engage and it'll replicate, okay? It'll replicate your narratives. Um, like I said, if you can't leave, invoke self-preservation methods without no, without any apology. And remember self-compassion and empathy when you're doing so. I'm doing ongoing collection data. Um, I, and um, I can send this to you. But these are the things that I'm currently gathering. I'm always gathering data on this. Strategies for improving low morale, the authentication experiences of library workers, job hunting during low morale experiences, the impact of a COVID-19 pandemic. I've been doing that literally since the pandemic started. These are all still open. And I'm looking at for formal leaders, the impact of what I call legacy toxicity on formal leaders. And I'm also looking at how low morale presents in library and unionized library workplaces. Um, these things are where I am right now. I have communities and um, commentary through Facebook communities. I'm on Instagram and uh, Twitter. You can share your story anonymously anytime, visit the website, and you can always ask me questions individually at my email at gmail.com. And I leave you with this quote that the most common way people give up their power is by thinking they don't have any by uh, Alice Walker, a living, um, a living person who loves us very much to share this with us today. So I'll take questions at this time. I'm gonna stop share. Thanks for your uh, listening at this time. And I am available for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katrina. That was really interesting. <laughs> I especially like the closing quote. Uh, we need, we all need to put that on our walls. Yes. Uh, so I think you've really been speaking to a lot of us because the chat, ah, I'm told okay. the chat has been very active. Oh, in wow. Hoover. Yes. So if you have time to hop over to Whova, um after the end of the session and just really? kind of review the chat, it'll still be there. Okay. And I think there, there'll be some stuff in there that you'll be interested to see. Uh, okay. My, my co-moderator over in Whova, Christine Fisher, has been gathering notes and questions for me and stuff. So I'm just going to review that. But first, I'm going to take the moderator's perk of asking one of my own questions. Okay. <laughs> I, I love qualitative research. I love it so much. But, you know, as you well know, the pitfall of it is that it can get kind of fuzzy. You know, you can sort of go way into the qualitative end and you have been so methodical and so yes. thorough and I just, yes. mm, I just love it. Uh, <laughs> but I was wondering if in all of your, you know, qualitative research, I, this is kind of quantitative, but I'm curious, are you seeing any differences in the data across library employees at different stages of their careers? Do you find that morale uh, problems worsen the further we, we go into our careers? Or are you seeing it in early career librarians as well? I don't see it as a timeline like you might be asking me. What I see though that is concerning is, particularly in the data collection project for COVID, what's concerning to me is that the majority of people saying they're going through low morale are new librarians. Mm, I was worried about that. So yeah. I'll leave that there. And that's why this is a retention <laughs> problem. So I'm not that looking is. at it like you're saying, because that data, then you're talking about getting in the weeds for the for the data yeah. that I'm yeah. So I, that will have to be like a separate project where I say, I want to hear only from you if you have this many years and only mm -hmm. that will that will pull that out more easily. And I haven't been doing it that way. Um, what I've been doing is say, you're going through low morale, talk to me. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, but I am concerned when I look at my data collection projects, that like a third of the librarians are new librarians. That's problematic. It is. Because a new librarian for me is zero, between zero to three years. Mm -hmm. And that means for the last two years since they started their jobs, they've been abused and neglected. Yeah. Okay. I, I was hoping that wasn't what you were gonna say, but I was worried it might be. <laughs> 
I have to report the data. I'm reporting the data. <laughs> we reporting can, the data. We but it is concerning for me, and that's why I continue to do the work because this is not just the old, it's just librarians telling me about their 20 year experience, right? Mm -hmm. that, but the problem with that even is when they talk to me about their 20 year experience, I didn't really necessarily realize that like, when I gather the demographic data, I don't look at it till later. So when they're just telling me their experience and people would tell me this and at the end of the conversation, I said, oh, so this just happened? And they were like, no, this was like 20 years ago. But they were talking to me like it happened yesterday mm -hmm. because it's trauma. And their bodies, are, I can, their bodies are tense enough. So that's the kind of understanding of time that I have that when it comes to time, the trauma, your body doesn't know the difference of it happened yesterday or 20 years ago. Yep. yep. Thank you for your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna jump into some attendee questions here because we've got about five minutes left in the session. Uh, one of our attendees is asking, how can we get supervisors and administrators to encourage and support financially and with work time professional development. It helps employees learn and it indicates commitment by the formal leadership and the organization. Well, that's a broad question because we know that uh, libraries are impacted by budgets. Who, and this is the interesting thing I can share with you. I'm gonna answer this question in another way. And apologies for not giving you the direct answer you're probably expecting. But I'm talking with you today about low morale. So we have to remember that low morale, people come to their organizations um, with low morale likely, library leaders, who are leaders are likely have done dealt with low morale. But outside of that, one of the things that I found out from my formal leader study is that, in, that library leaders dealing with low morale have an impact factor that they experience called Potemkin power. Now, I don't know if y'all know what the word Potemkin means, but technically it's a facade. It's a facade, go look it up. Well, Catherine the Great, her boyfriend, you know, she built all these things that made her cities, her, 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 her territory look really, really nice, but really it was just a facade. And so people may have a misunderstanding of the power that library leaders have. So when you think about the impacts to budgets that library leaders have and the unique situations of library leaders and their ability to advocate for money when people don't really know how libraries work and they perceive that libraries are not investments, but they are money takers. They don't bring revenue. You have to invest in libraries. You give us the money and then we put output. So when you think about those factors, I can see that question and it feels like, oh, you just, I should just be able to give you the money, but it's not necessarily that clear. Um, they're advocating for a lot of pieces and we know that libraries are very significantly having lower and lower allocations to monies. So my encouragement is that I think a better question is we need to have lab, we need to have a synergetic collaborative understanding of what library leaders can do and adjust the expectations, understanding that they have these new parameters in place that are even more exacerbated now by the pandemic. And this is where I also talk about formal leadership. So um, there are grants. So you can say, hey, leader, can we do a grant? To, um, to, to fund my continuing education? Um, what are some other ways? And because the traditional output is that I ask for money and then you send me to the conference. I think we're in a place right now where we have to say, we have to figure out together how we gonna get you to the conference together. What are some other ways? And that makes it more collaborative and not me versus them. So at the end of the day, low morale is not helpful when we think of us versus them mentalities in any sort of way. You, we want to be thinking about how can I work collaboratively and get it collaboratively with my leader so they can know that I understand their parameters and those parameters impact me and I can get the benefit and work with the leader rather than assuming that they're just not doing it. And, and as a person who has another life as an administrator, I guarantee you it is very difficult. And I am working very hard to get as much done because my thing is advocacy too. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We have so many questions and we have, we have two minutes. I'll do, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try to get done in 30 seconds, go. 
<laughs> so most of the questions are in Whova chat. We've got one in Q&A here, which is a great question, but I would like to pull one more out of Whova chat for the last okay. few minutes that I think um, it's going to be good. Uh, is there anything a minority candidate for a job can do about situations in the hiring process when your experiences and intellect are questioned, the whole fitness versus competence thing? If, if in the moment, how can a minority candidate address that? I, I think that's very broad because it would depend on the nature of the microaggression. So that's a hard question for me to answer. I thought it was hard, have, but it was a good question. <laughs> that's a hard answer because a microaggression presents in so many ways and I can't give words without getting a more specific understanding. But one of the things I can share with you is when people ask me questions that I think are, um, I ask for more clarity. I said, share with me a little bit about what more what you mean when you say. And you have to force them to re-examine re their question. I'm not sure I understand your question. Um, or, or if you don't want to say it that way, another thing is, tell, tell me more about what that, share, I, that's an interesting question. Share with me more about the question. That's, that is great. And just leave it and wait yeah. for them to expand. Because then you can stop the narrative that you're telling yourself. Because we're going to the narrative. Did she say what I thought she said? And now you're in there. Now you're trying to figure out their head and expending your energy on what they might have said when you could have just kept your energy and had them explain what they meant. Mm -hmm. And have them have that person do it. And that way they have to explain it. And you don't have to leave that whole interview thinking, did I say it wrong? Was that person really mean? And all the things that occur after a microaggression that ruin your health or deteriorate your mental space. So remain calm. Don't assume. And what you really want to do is clear, have them clarify. Always have that person clarify rather than go into what you're thinking. Make sure you know what they mean. That is excellent advice for, for all kinds of situations, but particularly for this. I, ha I just hate to have to cut this short. We I know. So I many other great questions that we have to talk about. Um, if anybody has asked a question within Zoom Q&A, it's not going to be retained after we close the session. So please, uh, I think Sh Shelby Webb, let me see. Yes, Shelby Webb, could you please transfer your question over to Huba Q&A? And that's going to stay persistent. So uh, Katrina, if you have time to go back and look at that, there's some great stuff in there. Also some really great podcast suggestions that I think you need to see. Yeah, there's, there's awesome. some awesome stuff. Um, so again, hate to have to end this. I understand. Session. But we do have concurrent sessions starting at 10, 10 a.m. Eastern. So everybody, please join us via the agenda there. And please remember, all of our sessions are being recorded. And you will have those recordings later. And slides will be coming. Thank you again so much, Katrina. We really appreciate it. Big round of applause for Katrina and Dean Gant. Yay! Thank you all so much. Remember to take care of yourselves. You are most important, most important. Y'all take care. You too. Bye. Bye, -bye.